This is the Ted Wallachian Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's The Meat People. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Fortino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's The Way Sausage Should Taste. And now, here's Ted. Welcome to a special podcast featuring comedy guests from past episodes, including Jan Arden, Colin Mockery, Rick Mercer, Kenny Robinson, Peter Wildman, Marla Lukowski, and starting with a comic that's recognized across this country as one of Canada's greatest stand-ups. And he's the author of the Leacock Medal for Humor Award-nominated book, All Over the Map. Here's the amazing Ron James. One of the great things that I found was you talk about revisiting cities where you've already performed and people who have come out to see you now three, four times over a course of three or four years. It, it, it's it's as though they get this relationship with you. They've built a relationship with you, and, and they've never really met you, and you become like 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 a close, long, long lost friend of theirs. <laughs> that's that's sweet. That, that's uh, I I suppose that's what's happened. I, I you know, and another thing they'll tell me too. They don't like it when I get too political. You know, I mean during Trump's era and the micromanaging uh, time of Harper here. Not that Harper and Trump are remotely close, but they both denied science. But, you know, as it behooves a comedian to rock the apple cart, not ride at it and speak truth to power, uh, they were uh, somewhat, um, somewhat, uh, not shaken's too strong a word, but it's not what they wanted to hear from me. And uh, I found that my evergreen content about just the daily struggles of life or growing up or um, things that are relatable were essential in building that foundation of faith in my funny across the country because they drove winter roads too, right? They had rock shoot into their windshield north of Prince George. Uh, They had uh, black ice beneath their wheels on the Qualicum Highway or, you know, had to deal with black ice on the road in PEI and and then so there was always a blend of content in my show that was customized for the region that had a certain uh, respect I suppose for uh, geography and their lives and their place in this as you say this disparate nation the big wide open yeah and all you have to do is drive through a prairie blizzard in late June when the blue days turn pit bull ugly shapeshifter fast. And, you know, you can't see your hand in front of your face and you're in the friggin' car. I think they respected the fact that I drove from town to town and city to city bringing the funny because their lives, they flew below the red carpet radar too. And that was never a priority for me. It's why I put the quote by Billy Conley uh, before the foreword. Chase fame, see what that does to your soul. Yeah. It's all about the work and it's all about the joy of the work. And save for a couple of times, I think I was wrestling with the flu on the road. I can't think of too many experiences that I didn't genuinely enjoy 110%. When you first made your move to, uh, to Los Angeles, you like so many different performers, whether comedians, musicians, leaving this country, you went there thinking... Well, in order to really succeed in this industry, I have to succeed there. Correct. But in time, your thoughts changed when you realized that it wasn't somebody who was going to deliver the success to you. It was you that had to, and I'm paraphrasing, but it was you that had to go out and find it yourself. Correct. You had to build your own stage. It made all the difference in the world. And um, I got to tip my hat to my ex, you know, June for that. I remember the night we were sitting on that patio during another endless, beautiful indigo evening in paradise. And uh, she said, look, when we go back to Canada, you can't do the same thing. And I was a journeyman actor, man. I just like character actor, commercials, few guest spots here and there, the occasional movie once every three years, you know, and uh, never enough to sustain us or, 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 or plan actually on uh, 
feeding a family and putting your kids through university, simple middle-class dreams and uh, maybe a house someday. And she said, you know, you got to do it yourself. And um, I hit the wall with all the auditioning and hoping somebody else would make a difference for me that I'd land that sitcom grail. And so coming back to Canada, uh, I took a page from Joseph Campbell and just followed my bliss and wrote up and down in shaky town. And, um, it was a slow, uh, it was a, a series of baby steps to self-empowerment because after I wrote shaky town, I still had to go back and do amateur night at the, then the laugh resort, which is gone. Mm -hmm. Uh, but, uh, I did amateur night for six months, you know, and, um, I kept getting better and better. And I finally got a, uh, a gig, a paying gig, uh, that I split the gig with a guy by the name of Barry Julian, who I believe has won six Peabody Awards as the producer of uh, uh, the... Um, Stephen Colbert. Steve Colbert, right. And uh, so uh, I stayed with it. And I, I just, I had gone through with so much uh, angst and disappointment and trials looking to land commercials with armies of other screen actor guild uh card holders or even back in canada and i'd done it all and i wanted to make sense of the world in my own terms i wanted to m connect the dots and the chaos we're all walking through as a roadmap so we could or i could understand it too in the language of the laughs and it's interesting, Ted, because it took a long time, you know, I mean, it wasn't 10 years, it was, it took 10 years for me to be totally comfortable in my own skin up there. And um, I had friends say to me when they'd seen me after a while, because I mean, it, it, it's unbearable for me to watch my early just for laugh set. Uh, a critic called me Stephen Leacock on Benzedrine. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was so accurate, because I never took the time to let the words breathe. I never looked, took the time to enjoy the pause. I was always, I was always, I always had my car too far down the road before I'd even pulled it out of the driveway, if you yep. know what I mean. And that took time. And I came to the conclusion one day, I said, well, of course it's gonna take time. Because the first hammer a carpenter picks up, he doesn't build a mansion. He's gotta hit himself in the thumb. And you got to bomb and you got to hear crowds go contemptibly quiet or turn ugly as um, Visigoths on the outskirts of Rome. You have to fail and you have to look at this work as the art form it deserves to be seen as. And you don't catch lightning in a bottle. It's a lifelong learning curve. And you know, Ted, I'm back in the writing room today and a blank page looks exactly the friggin' same today as it did when I started 25, 30 years ago. That's Ron James. We'll find out if he wins the Leacock Medal for Humor for his book all over the map next month. Kenny Robinson is a quarter century comic veteran in this country. He's an actor as well. Originally hails from Winnipeg, calls Toronto his home now. Here is Kenny Robinson. And how did you make it from you? So you went from Winnipeg to Chicago, yeah. Back to Winnipeg, then to, to Toronto. Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, well, I came to Toronto basically to get involved in comedy. I was doing stand up uh, and taking acting classes while I was in Chicago, and I was an extra in the Blues Brothers. So I forced myself to go and talk to Dan Aykroyd, yeah, yeah. and I told him I was Canadian, and I, I didn't know if I should move to uh, to Las Vegas or perhaps Toronto because they had yuck yucks here. And uh, Dan said, well, uh, Vegas is more for the established acts, so maybe you should think of Toronto. And, and I said, OK. And then uh, that was uh, I, I took uh, I, I took uh, uh, Elwood, uh, Elwood Blues's uh, advice. And that's where I wound up here ever since. So I guess yeah. it was a good move. I think so. 1998, Now Magazine um, announced you to be comic of the year. Uh, you, twice that's happened to you. They've, you. You've been named comic of the year. What did that mean to you? Uh, it's a false start. You get that and you think, of course, the, the bigger gigs and and uh, the better things are going to come along. But, uh, you know, you being in the business, you know, there's many false starts and there's many uh, 
there's, you know, there, there's, uh, there's uh, many stepping stones and then some are bigger than others. So, but it meant a lot. I mean, cause uh, I was doing material that was uh, not mainstream. You know, I wasn't one of the, the safer acts. I worked blue and uh, when I wasn't blue, I was political and, and, uh, and racially charged with a lot of the stuff. So I really was never, um, you know, a safe act to, uh, to get involved with. Right. And, and how much of your act has changed over the years? Unfortunately, not that much. Well, it's, it's different. Now, when I, before I go on, I hear some of this stuff the younger comics are saying. Yeah. And I go, Jesus, I got banned from working a whole entire region of the country for less stuff than that. <laughs> so it's like, uh, you know, I, I imagine it had to be similar to like when Elvis saw David Bowie and they said, man, they, you know, they filmed me only from the waist up. This guy's, you know, this guy's wearing uh, heels and, and makeup. So, um, you know, things change and, uh, you know, but I'm still pretty edgy, though. I'm still going to handle the material that uh, that most comics won't. And um, I always I, maybe that's because uh, that's just my personality or, uh, you know, there's something lacking in in lacking in my development somewhere but speaking of uh, uh, comics with, with an edge you worked in, in a film called down to earth with, with chris rock what was mm-hmm. that yeah it was uh chris was uh well i yeah down to earth i worked with chris but also uh the show that got me my first now cover i opened for him at the um i guess it was called the diamond club then or, or it's changed it was the one down on sherburn yeah, it, you, yeah. The, a number of them have, have changed. Yeah, so they, they've changed names now. But uh, they didn't know how to properly book him or, or, or promote him because he had just got fired from Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. So the billing was Chris Rock, the black guy from Saturday Night Live. So they could have mentioned New Jack City. They could have mentioned this film that he had just got made, uh, CB4 or something like that. But instead, they billed him as the... So... Um, it was doing that show that kind of helped lead towards the Nubian show because I was doing material uh, that evening about OJ Simpson and about, uh, you know, racial profiling and, uh, you know, all the things that were hot topics. It was the first time when I had a predominantly black audience in front of me. Yeah. So, uh, you know, when I talked about Dwight Drummond getting pulled over at gunpoint, trying to get chicken from that place at, at Dundas and Sherburn, the audience went crazy it was, you know, so that's how I knew there was, uh, um, there was definitely a market for, uh, for what the Nubians would become. And Dwight Drummond for those people outside of Toronto is a, a newscaster. He used to be at city TV and now he's at the CBC, I believe. Yeah. Uh, I, we actually went to the same school, except he's about a hundred years after me. Actually, I went to the same high school in Chicago as R Kelly. We each went there for a year. So I don't know if that's the type of thing I should brag about, but, uh, <laughs> And there, there was about 10 or 15 years separating us between R. Kelly and myself. That is Kenny Robinson. Marla Lakowski. Well, what can I tell you? She's a singer, a voice artist. She's one of the Care Bears, an actress and a comedian. In other words, a multi-talented individual who puts on one heck of a show. Here now, Marla Lakowski. A lot of people say I have a voluptuous body. Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> You can always spot me in the summertime. I'm the one walking down the beach with my thighs applauding. <laughs> yeah, the fiction air, you know, girls. Sparks flying and, and people with cigarettes, no matches, chasing me for like. You know. <laughs> nice to see you. How are you? I'm wonderful. Nice to see you too, Ted. It has been a while. We've, we've known each other for, I was thinking about that the other day. Was it like 20 years, 30 years? For sure. It was Something definitely, like I would say, since 1978. Mm. One of us was still a virgin, and I remember that. <laughs> it was me. Okay. <laughs> I won't give you the deets on that one. Um, I didn't, I, you know, I didn't realize that, that you had begun, when we first met, uh, um, uh, we, we were both doing stand-up, but, but you had begun way, way before that. You, you, you you're, you go back to like 1973 when you were a teenager. You you performed at the at the, the I talk about iconic the Riverboat Cafe, the, exactly. the coffee house I should say, exactly uh, the a, coffee house. Yeah, and you just like balls to the wall, pick up the phone and said, "Hey, I'm a singer and I want to come perform." 
That's exactly it. I thought, why not start at the top? I have nothing to lose. I was tired of playing in my bedroom. And as you know, the article said, when can you get down here? Our opening act just canceled. And I said, 30 minutes. And I was there in 20. You know, and the first thing I did was go into that green room and look for Joni Mitchell's name. And I made sure that I signed my name near hers on the wall. And then right. I had tons of diarrhea. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, you, you, you really began your career as not as a comedian, but rather as, as a folk singer, a folk singer who, who told funny stories in between tunes. That's exactly right. And uh, I wrote a few serious songs, but I wrote funny songs. So it was innately coming out of me still. And they were three minute funny songs. And, you know, uh, there I was at the riverboat doing my funny songs and people are smiling. And then in between the songs, you chat to the audience and they started to laugh, like really laugh. And I went, ooh, I like that. I think I'm going <laughs> to talk some more. And then I played yeah. a song and they sat there and smiled. And then I finished the song and talked again and they laughed out loud. And that's oh. when the manager came up to me and said, you're not a singer, you're a comic. Go to all the funny nights at the folk clubs. Yeah, and did you, did you, did you do the, the comedy in between the songs as just a way of sort of passing time or to relieve stress, tension, nerves, for example? Yeah, that's exactly what I was doing. But because I'm a very open, honest person, I was telling them about my loose bowels because I was so nervous and how I used to take all the toilet paper and put it all on the toilet seat. And then when I would sit down, it would swoosh all the toilet paper off. And then there was no more toilet paper and they would be <laughs> laughing. And then I told them something else that happened to me on the way down because I was I was having the baby seat in the car and the guitar in the yeah. guitar. And I said, well, I have the baby seat, not because I have a baby, but because I can't see over the dash. You know, mm. so, and they were just laughing, unlike you. But I, they were just laughing. No, no. <laughs> you, you, and and you, and you do make fun of your of, of your height because you're as, as Groucho Marx once said, uh, he's well over four feet. How tall are you? <laughs> I'm five feet and shrinking. Yeah, well, so am I. But I'm taller so, than that. But I'm but I'm shrinking too, and I, and I hate that. Uh, well, but, but I, you're, you're five feet. I'm but, fine but not, and drinking, it, I, but, but you know what they say, you know, when you grow older, you can be guaranteed of two things. You shrink and your nose keeps growing. I'm screwed. <laughs> I figure funny. by that time I'm 65, I'm going to have to walk on my nose to reach the top shelf. Well, you know what I noticed that some of the uh, uh, older gentlemen, their ears keep going. Like I think by That's the time it. George George Burns hit 100, I, I swore <laughs> I thought he was going to fly away. <laughs> It's true. I noticed that my earlobes are getting lower and lower. So it's the nose, it's the ears, and you're shrinking. And it's like, this yeah. is cruel upon cruel. Yeah, you're right. So uh, 1973, this all begins for you. A, a bit of a momentous occasion for you, I suppose. Uh, a watershed moment. 1975, at, at the Friars Club in Toronto, the late Gene Taylor, who is a television performer, singer, comedian, used to run uh, an improv there and yep. all kinds of performers would come down and you went down there one night and you killed him. I killed him. And he said, you're a regular, you got to come every weekend. And I said, okay. And I loved it. it. It was a really quaint room. It was all easy chairs. It was mm -hmm. all easy chairs and these little coffee tables and cocktail tables and everybody was really nice, and Larry Horowitz was there, and uh, a couple other guys. And then, of course, you know, one night Rick Moranis came in with Rob Cowan, and they did their bit. But uh, Rob Cowan wrote a great paragraph about his memory of that I raised the bar for everybody because I just I did well with the guitar, and then I take off the guitar, and then I do the Wizard of Oz in three minutes and impressions. And you know, Gene was so supportive and nice to me. The thing is, Ted. I can't get it out of my head. He pulled me aside and he said, if you don't play Massey Hall by the time you're 30, you're never gonna. And it's like, oh my God, it was getting close to 30 years old and I wasn't getting Massey Hall. It was not, uh, nope, it wasn't in the cards for me. And I thought, oh God, what did he know? The Wizard of Oz in three minutes, the first time that I, that I heard you do that, I, I was on the floor laughing, and I'm thinking, I have no idea where you came up with that concept, but you did it with a number of different films in addition to The Wizard, right? 
Yeah, I did it for um, CBC Radio. They had seen me do my act, and they had approached me and said, would you be willing to write three-minute movies for all sorts of different movies, movies from the past and movies that are currently playing, and you'll be a regular on the Arthur Black show called Basic Black, which is um, a national show. And I said, absolutely. So I did. So I did Funny yeah. Girl. I did The King and I. And I also did The Sound of Music. The hills are alive with the sound of music. I'm trying to be a nun at the Abbey in Salzburg, Austria, but I'm always late for things because I'm singing about nature. You're always late, Maria, and now me and the sisters have to have a meeting about you. Well, what do you think, girl? She's a pest. She's a pig. She's a pain in the axis to the tree. How do you solve a problem like Maria? How does she sing and make her nostrils flare? I've decided, Maria, that you have that to is Marla. Lukowski, all four or five different ones of her. She's an amazing talent and a great lady as well. Colin Mockery is a master at the art of improv. To me, one of the most difficult forms of comedy that there is. For some, it's a natural. For him, it seems that way. Uh, he's also a great actor and a very, very funny man. Colin Mockery. So at one point, you're in Vancouver and you decide, you know what, I needed a bit of a change in my career and you decide to up and move to, to Toronto. And you're introduced yeah. to, to Second City. You go to, you go to audition in Second City, and, and your future wife, Deb McGrath, is the one who's doing the audition. Yeah. Um, and again, this is due to Ryan. Um, he had done, at Expo um, in Vancouver, he mm -hmm. had done the Second show, City show there. And, of course, you know, he was brilliant, so they brought him back to Toronto to join the main stage there. So I had moved out to Toronto. He called me and said, look, they're looking for someone in the touring company. I give him your name, go and audition. So I did. And, uh, yeah, I was auditioned by uh, Deb, one of the longest, hardest auditions I've ever done. Um, <laughs> and then was she I, fair? I got it. Was she well, fair to you? At the, you start off with, like, 40 people. And yeah. then... It goes down to 20 and then it ended up there was four of us so there's the four of us we finished she comes up to me and says it was between you and the cute guy <laughs> oh, <right>. oh. <laughs> and so and at, and at no time you're thinking to yourself i'm going to marry this woman one day no and, well, uh, no i thought well okay. assuming assuming the cute guy doesn't want her yeah this is a tough room <laughs> so uh yeah so and then from then it, it all worked out so again and of course and ryan was also instrumental in getting me um whose line so i feel you know he got me a wife he got me a job he may have fathered my child it's hard to say. <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of friend he is god you owe him big time don't you <laughs> i do i really it, do uh, speaking of, of, of whose line is it, it they came to second city to audition the, the cast there yeah, to find members for this, but because everybody works as a team, that worked against you somehow. Yeah, because we did that thing where everybody was supporting each other, so nobody stood out. We were doing some very funny scenes, but it was <laughs> very equal, so none of us got it. Uh, and it wasn't until the next year we'd moved down to L.A. because Deb and her writing partner uh, Linda Cash had written this show that was being produced by Imagine Television. And I got to audition again with people I didn't know. So it was like, hey, screw you. Look at me. <laughs> and there you go, young people. That's how you get ahead in this business. Exactly. There's words of wisdom right there for you. So, so eventually you got it. Now, there's a British version and a U.S. version. Yeah. Were they running simultaneously? I, I know you were, doing, you were doing This Hour Has 22 Minutes at the same time as you were doing a Who's Line. But which was happening when I'm confused? Because as I mentioned at the outset before we started rolling here, that in doing all this research, sometimes it gets a little confusing because the research can be a little misleading or dumb. Oh, yeah, there's been there's stuff out there. There was there was a thing out there that I'd killed Ryan accidentally. I backed my <laughs> car into him, and I thought <laughs> it, that's so easy to check. <laughs> but um, whose line started as a British radio show? with people like uh, Stephen Fry and Hugh Laurie. Mm -hmm. um, and then it went to television. And it was still, an, uh, improv was still a, a new art in right. uh, Britain. So they started bringing Americans over. And that's when I got uh, involved. So 
they always wanted to do an American version. So in 1997, we were actually doing the last of the British version, shooting in Hollywood, and we went right from that to the American version with Drew Carey. So it, and it really wasn't much of a, well, I mean, it, I mean, it was the same production staff, the same producers, so we knew everyone. The only thing different was that we now had to deal with censorship, which was something we right. never had in Britain. Of course. I mean, the things the Brits did to the Queen on that show were <laughs> <laughs> But when we started um, our first couple of tapings, there was a scene where I was supposed to kiss Greg Proops, or I was in love with Greg Proops. So uh, I kissed him. And then this voice came out of nowhere because the censor had no script to look at. They were in the booth. And they said, can you make up something else, please? <laughs> so... Drew Carey has a real button on censorship. Uh -huh. So the next 20 minutes was unusable because he would introduce the next game with words you can't use on television. So <laughs> um, they finally came up with this thing and said, here's the deal. We'll do the show. And then after the show, the uh, producer and the censor would fight over whatever things happened. So it didn't interrupt the flow of the show. And one of my favorite memories is that Dan Patterson, the man who created the show, coming up after one of the meetings and said, Colin, Colin, we lost the pussy, but we got two penises. <laughs> <laughs> I love this business. Well, sounds like a sports trade between two hockey teams. <laughs> it is. It is. So, so you're doing it. You're doing whose line is it? And, and how does uh, this hour has 22 minutes enter into the picture? Yeah, I was doing Who's Line. I was doing um, a guest shot on Made in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, Rick Mercer's show. Sure. And the showrunner for that, uh, Mark Farrell, was also the showrunner for 22 Minutes. And I was talking to Peter Callahan, and it was lunchtime. And um, he was saying, God, you work a lot. And I said, yeah, I've been very lucky. He said, well, you know, Mercer's leaving 22 Minutes. You should do that. Just as Mark Farrell was passing. So, kind of like my Murdoch tweet, I got a call to um, maybe audition, and um, I got it, uh, which was gr it was excellent. My first season, it was a month after nine eleven, oh. so it was a little obviously tense. Nobody was sure how do you make f or how, where how can you make fun of this. Uh, so it was. Great for me having Mark and the great writers plus the cast coming up with ways of we couldn't go for, you know, the main event, so to speak. But the insanity around it, we could still right. make fun of. We could still make people making fun of the people making the weird choices and letting fear rule their lives. That's Colin Mockery, a master at the art of improv and a bit of his background. Ted Wallachian returns in a moment. Hey, it's Ted Wallison for Tom's Place. You know, our fall merchandise is starting to arrive, but we still have massive amounts of summer clothing that needs to be cleared. Blowout sale prices on virtually everything, like cone suits, regularly six fifty, now three ninety nine each, or three for a thousand dollars. Plus, beautiful sports jackets and designer dress pants, fifty percent off. Check out our deals throughout the store with huge savings off our already below retail prices. If you need a suit for an upcoming special event, we are Toronto's one-stop suit shop. For the finest outfit for every occasion, there is no better time to find the perfect addition to your wardrobe. Everything is on sale to make way for our fall merchandise. Tom's Place is open weekdays from 11 to 6, 10 to 5 Saturday, 12 to 5 Sunday. Visit Tom's Place, 190 Baldwin in Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. Now back to Ted Wallachian. Rick Mercer is yet another nominee for the Leacock Medal for Humor Award for his book, Talking to Canadians, a memoir. We talked to Rick Mercer. He shared his stories from his book and his life. Here he is. Talking to Americans, uh, you, you, you film segments in Washington. You, you film segments uh, at Harvard University. You filmed in Little Rock, uh, the home of uh, soon-to-be President uh, Bill Clinton. 
and you, and you would set up scenarios and ask Americans to comment on Canadian uh, news news items. One of which was the <laughs> the summit, the Ben Murgy Clinton summit, telling people that our Prime Minister was Ben Murgy. Of course, he, he took the name from Ralph Ben Murgy, who was doing a late night talk show on CBC Television at the time, and people would comment on that, and then. You, you you shot outside or in front of Mount Rushmore and told people that Canada owned the plutonium rights in Mount Rushmore. And, <laughs> and in order for to find out whether it was worth anything, they had to drill through the heads of the presidents uh, to, to check the quality of the plutonium. A, people bought it. And, oh, they always and, bought it. But they didn't even really get pissed off. They were thinking like, well, well if you have to do this, can you do it from the back? So that won't well, that's what started. shocked me about that. No one said, no, you can't drill into the president's heads and <laughs> no one said who in the god's name sold the mining rights to mount rushmore to yeah. the canadians they just accepted that that was their their commitment to the almighty dollar and drill baby drill i mean let's they're gonna willing to drill into the heads they're willing to drill in alaska uh it was it was so much fun because this doesn't happen very often you have i'm on a hit show you can imagine and uh, suddenly i stumble upon this thing that there's just this insane appetite for. It's kind of like SCTV was a hit TV show. And then, uh, you know, the boys did a sketch that was an afterthought that was half improv called Bob and Doug McKenzie that was yeah. making fun of making fun of CanCon rules. And they just banged it off and kind of came up with every hackneyed Canadian stereotype they can imagine. And Canadians loved it. And from then on, all, as a kid, all we cared about was, is Bob and Doug going to be on this week's episode yeah. of SCTV? And yeah. that's what talking to Americans was like. Suddenly, it was it, there was a huge demand for it. It was super popular. <laughs> it wasn't that hard. Uh, it, it was it was really, truly exciting. But and, did you not feel a little bit of remorse, though? Because, I mean, you're painting Americans to be stupid, uh, yeah. or not stupid, but at least ignorant when, when it comes to their knowledge of, of Canada. And, and I think oh. we all believe that growing up, you know, it's, it's the old people showing up at the border with skis in July. Sure. That thing. In your book, you said, quote, I felt a tad, it was a tad unsportsmanlike. It wasn't shooting fish in a barrel. It was more throwing dynamite in a shallow pool. All I had to do was stand there with a net and scoop them up as they floated to the surface. Well, and I always, I felt terrible too, because uh, almost every single person who appeared on Talking to Americans, they did so because uh, of this incredible feeling of generosity towards Canada. They might not have known anything about Canada, but yeah. I can't tell you how many times I'd be standing on the corner, I got the big camera, I've got my suit on, I got the mic in my hand, and I would start to speak to someone, excuse me, sir, and they go, nope, 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 they don't want to talk. And then I'd say, do you have a moment for... Canadian television. Then they'd stop and they go, "Well, I guess I could talk to Canadian television." <laughs> and so they were being very generous to do so in their instinct. If it was an American news team, now I want to talk to you. So that used to make me feel bad. But I justified it by thinking they'll never know about this. There's no YouTube. Hadn't been invented yet. There's no way they'll ever know. They just yeah. they'll just go home and say, "Oh, I, I did a." interview on Canadian uh, news. Did you know that they're, they're thinking of legalizing insulin in Canada? And I told them that I thought that was a good idea. And they just won't know any difference. And uh, also, I guess, uh, you know, man's got to eat. <laughs> you know, you, but, but my father, my father never, ever, to this day, ever speaks to me about anything that I do professionally or weighs in with any opinion. And it was the only time he said, oh, I saw that talking to Americans. I said, oh, dad, people love it. You wouldn't believe he said, yeah, yeah, promise me you'll never do that again. It's terrible. <laughs> then he started talking about how, you know, in the, during the, the Halifax explosion, how the Americans sent sweaters up to help us. And I was like, stop it, stop it. I can't, I can't hear about that right now. I can't. <laughs> hey, I've but, got but, a show but, to do. But they generally, the Canadian, the Americans, but they generally like Canadians. They, you know, I sound well, like Sean sure. Field. They really like us, right? Sure. But they were, and they were really happy when I told them that we were opening our first college. And obviously, because it's Canada, there was only agricultural related degrees. And they were like, oh, no, but give it time. Soon you'll be able to produce your own teachers and nurses. <laughs> well, thank you. But they were very happy for us. Yeah. And, and then you got them to sign a petition uh, telling Prime Minister Jean Chrétien 
uh, we, uh, we referred to as the Right Honorable Paul Martin, I should say, uh, uh, Prime Minister in waiting, uh, and and then Tete Le Maire. Shit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we started going to, when I did the thing at uh, Mount Rushmore, someone said, uh, well, Gerald said, uh, I said, Mount Rushmore, was, I loved it. And I had this idea of going to national historic sites in America and using them as our backdrop because, A, I would love to visit national historic sites in America, and I knew they would make great backdrops. The problem was at Mount Rushmore is it was all bus tours, and they they were decidedly older. So when I came back with the Mount Rushmore tape, I said, oh, so funny. They all believe that we're going to mine the heads. And Gerald said, well, if you keep going to national monuments, you're going to have to rename the segment to picking on seniors. And then it was like, oh, you're right. They were all kind of old. So then we decided, and then people started saying, oh, these people, they don't know what they're saying. There's some sort of trick here. So I thought we have to prove that they do know what we're saying and that we're not just picking on poor seniors. So we decided to go to Harvard University. Yeah. We know where the young and the brightest are. And then to really drive home the fact that these people know what they're saying. We created petitions and we made them read the petition out loud. Of course, they're all, all of them reading Paul Martin, Ted the Mayor, just made me, the nine year old boy inside of me, laugh because none of them were aware <laughs> that they were saying Paul Martin shithead. And uh, I mean, guess I didn't bump into a French major, but uh, the petitions were, you know, urging Canada to consider stopping the policy of placing our seniors on ice floes and leaving them to perish. People were totally yeah. outraged about that. <laughs> but no one said, why don't you ban it? They just wanted us to consider, reconsider the policy. And uh, we had the Saskatchewan seal hunt and the Toronto polar bear hunt and people decrying it as a terrible environmental crime against humanity and stuff like that. It was great fun. And, and the university students were so strident, they would just line up. They would literally line up. And then as soon as one person signed the petition, they just step out of the way and the next one would come in and take the petition and read it out and sign it with great indignity. Well, I'm speaking with Rick Mercer. His memoir is called uh, Talking to Canadians. We talk about the, um, your Talking to American special. Just to give people an idea how popular it was, uh, this hour had 22 minutes, was pulling in about a million, million and a half viewers, I think somewhere around there. And and when you debuted Talking to Americans, you got a phone call here in Jamaica, Slako Klemke, who's head of English programming from CBC Calls, and said you clocked in at 2.7 million viewers. Yeah. That's outstanding. Well, we didn't know that was even possible. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's uh, it's like not, it's not the great cop. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I remember Gerald said, that's, uh, that's game five, Stanley Cup, Stanley Cup numbers. It's not a Canadian team in the series, but still, it's game five. Yeah. But uh, it was that big of a number. Uh, that's how popular it was. Yeah, it was astounding. It was astounding. Yeah. It was so much, it was so much fun. Um, and then the special got a whole whack of nominations. Uh, and then 9-11 happened. And uh, suddenly the joke didn't seem that funny anymore. And uh, we pulled all the nominations. Uh, it would have been fine probably to keep them, but uh, I didn't need any statues. Um, I, my career was underway. And then we made the further decision to, uh, much to Slocko's chagrin and everyone else's, to not do the segment again and, uh, and not do another special. I mean, because it's TV, you pull in 2.7 million on, on April Fool's. Yeah. Hey, next April Fool's, do another one. Yeah, of course. And do it for the rest of your life, maybe. And I just made the decision that it was threatening to become the thing and the only thing that I was known for. So we just stopped. That is the amazing Rick Mercer, who uh, we hope to have on the show in the next uh, few weeks or so. He's got a brand new television series called uh, The Comedians. So we look forward to that. Let me introduce you to Peter Wildman. I first met him years ago when he was part of the comic group Frantics. And the Frantics were a very, very funny group. Went on to do a radio series and a television series and a number of albums as well. He's now branched out on his own. He is very funny, very insightful, and very dark in a very nice way. Here now, Peter Wildman. Let's talk about uh, about what one of the songs that that you wrote, which uh, was was it 
I got my head up my ass, and that's I'm not talking about myself. Oh, yeah. That's the name of the song. Was was that yes. written with Trump in mind, or was it written with any other politician in mind specifically? I was I was at I was I was at work uh, at chorus, and I was dealing with somebody difficult. Mm. And as I was walking back to my desk, I just as I often do is I just I just hum or sing or do something and, and I hundred I got my head so far up my ass I can see most of my colon. <laughs> and I went, Whoa that's where the hell did that come from? So I quickly, you know, you get out your phone and you record it and uh and then it uh, it started making more sense to me and, and I started uh writing more and more, adding more verses and whatnot. But eventually uh, if you write a song like that, there has to be some kind of a payoff at the end. Mm. Like, where, where's this going? This guy's got his head up his ass. Oh, politics, of course. Um, and, um, and of course, I, I love bashing conservatives. We can talk about that later. Um, <laughs> and um, at the time, it was Stephen Harper was driving me crazy. So I uh, got my head so far up my ass. Uh, I like Stephen Harper. And uh, so I fashioned that. Sang it uh, publicly. It just kills in public. It's 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 in at the places I play. They love it. Um, and um, well, then Harper gets kicked out of office. I'm like, oh, that's too bad. I guess I'll never play this song again. And then along comes Trump. Mm. You go, oh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll play it for Trump while he's campaigning to be president. I mean, I'll never sing it after the election because there's no way he's yeah. going to win. It. Hey, Wait, he exactly. won. Ah, exactly. Great. Four more <laughs> years. I'm singing head up my ass. So, uh, of course, now we're, uh, you know, we got a June election with uh, uh, Dougie coming up. So uh, I may have to uh, Resurrect write another verse. Have you ever had a colonoscopy? Yes. Yes, I've had, uh, I, I, uh, I've had uh, three of them. Cause I, think, I didn't know your questions were going to be that personal. Well, no, because uh, Ted, I was just, but, uh, just thinking that the next time you do that, take your guitar with you, and just before <laughs> they put you under, semi-under, <laughs> say, I'd like to sing a song for you, doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. there we go. For those, people, dan, 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 dan. Yeah, for those people who have not had the, the pleasure of listening to that song, let's listen to it right now. Uh, here you go. Here's Peter Waldman. I've got my head so far up my ass I can see most of my colon. I can see where crap is flowing. With a rectum around my neck, I got my cheeks both parted. I've not farted, but there's a lot of gas. I know this because my head shoved up my ass. People ask me, what's it like to have an anus for a hat? I tell them I am flexible, thank God my head's not fat. Hey, I can see my colon, it says healthy as can be. Yes, I just gave myself my own colonoscopy. I've got my head so far up my ass, I can see last Thursday's chicken. I can see the gravy sticking to my intestinal walls, but now digestion stop. We're all backed up. Looks like no poop will pass, because I've got my head shoved way up my ass. With my head up my ass, I can espouse my political view, like how voting Republican is better for me and you. Let's lower taxes on the rich and let's all vote pro life. There's no whining liberals up my ass and I can't hear my wine. <laughs> that is a that is a very <laughs> funny, very funny song. And and I'm glad that this is it's a podcast a... and we're not on the radio. Most people think of Jan Arden as a singer. She's a great singer. She's got a terrific voice, a, a spectacular personality. She's got her own television show. But she is probably one of the funniest women that I have had the opportunity to interview in all my years working in radio. I love chatting with her anytime I get the opportunity. And we had that opportunity. Let me share some of those moments with you. Here's Jan Arden. I remember you did a, a, a bit when I was doing the morning show at CFRB where you started talking about as a young girl coming of age and having your first period and not wanting to admit what was going <laughs> on and how you started to hoard toilet paper so yeah. that you could make your own yeah. stuff. I, was made, I, I, I made them for a year. I, <laughs> I was so, I had no dialogue of, of that nature with my mom and I certainly wasn't going to say anything to my dad. I had two brothers. Yeah. I was, I was 17 years old, so I was a late bloomer. And dad would say, where is all the goddamn toilet paper going in this house? <laughs> Jesus Christ. And meanwhile, I'm like, wing, ding, 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 wing, you know, making fashioning maxi pads. 
And um, yeah, I just, it, it's being the only girl is always, it's a very trepidatious time in a mm-hmm. family of brothers. I guess it would be. I guess it would be. I have a younger sister and I have an older brother. So uh, yeah, I, I think I know exactly. Ask her story. sometime. Ask her sometime. Yeah. But yeah, I, I, I managed to survive it. And and, uh, and and never mind that. Like I, I was in a really small, small school. I wasn't, I wasn't in the city. I, I don't know. We didn't have the internet. We couldn't go and get information from anywhere but your cousin Karen. And she's trying to talk you into tampons. And you're like, <laughs> what? And then, and then your, your other friends telling you that tampons are for married people. And you're like, what? You're just so confused. Yeah. I guess you couldn't just go to a uh, Sam Druck or the local guy at the, at the general store and ask him <laughs> for his opinion. Either. Well, I, I should have, but welcome to the podcast, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the conversation. You're with Ted Willershine and Jan Arden, and we're talking about periods. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. As we move into the second period here with Chad Arden, I want to talk about some of the other things that you've done. I mentioned this is just a litany of things that you've done. One of the things that you did was you were a judge on a singing competition. I've talked to a lot of musicians about their thoughts of these competitions and how some of them believe that you're setting people up for a failure, even though they may think that they're going to be succeeding. Well, it's a bit of a caveat to that story. I was indeed a judge with Vanilla Ice. And I think, I can't remember who the other guy was. He was like from a big rock band. We were judging groups of people like from offices that were competing to donate, I believe it was $10,000 to a charity of their choice. Right. So it was called Canada Sings. They went across the country and it was like a group of firemen, a group of nurses, a group of teachers. And yes, we did have to judge these people. And there was a lot of broken hearts, you know, at the end of the show when they had been working for two months to learn this dance routine and this song and they didn't win. Uh, but the, the, uh, I think it, I think it was global that did the show. I can't remember. I, I probably will get slapped on the wrist for this, but I think they started giving even the people that didn't win also money to give to their charities. So they realized that they couldn't let these people go home without anything. But as to your question of judging singing competitions, very slippery slope. I mean, you're seeing in the last 20 years, these cycles of picking complete people from obscurity and in a 14 or 15 week cycle, catapulting one of these people into stardom. And now they have like one song from a singing competition and they're expected to record a record and get out on the road and tour. Well, what happened was 95% of these people you never heard from again, but a couple of them made it through. Kelly Clarkson comes to mind, um, you know, Carrie Underwood. And, you know, so there was a couple people that did survive the contesting. And even going back to the 70s, ABBA was part of the Eurovision mm-hmm. Song Contest. So I can't, I can't shake a finger at contesting because there is exceptional things that rise out of those situations and no can you judge talent no but there are exceptions to every rule uh i mean abba they they weren't together that long but you know here's a group of people that 40 years later just put out a an album called voyage that's now billboard top you know 10 and they've been nominated for grammys I don't know. Talent is talent is talent. That's the amazing Jan Arden. And that's it for this, our special edition of our podcast featuring comedy guests from the past. We'll do it again sometime within the next year when we've collected a whole bunch more very, very funny people. Thanks very much for listening. Talk to you next week. The Ted Walsh and Podcast has been brought to you by Tom's Place. For the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices, it's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. And Helenda's, the meat people. Enjoy their award-winning products at selected Metro, Sobeys, Portino's, and Foodland locations. Helenda's, the way sausage should taste. The Ted Walsh and Podcast is produced by Joey Roselli. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. I'm Becky Coles. 
Submit your questions and comments to ted at twmedia.ca.